Well, I wanted to uh, welcome everybody to the final, the, the final episode of It's a Brain Thing. We've been doing this for about two and a half years now, and, uh, and this is probably the last one we'll do. We've covered most of the main topics that I wanted to cover. I'm not saying I'll never do it again, but uh, at this point it won't be the monthly thing throughout the year that it's been, and I'm going to take a little break. So thank you all for coming tonight. I'm very pleased to welcome a good friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Dr. Dalton, who is a clinical psychologist. She uh, worked with, we worked together for about three years, I think, so a lot of patients together, and she has some uh, expertise in the, the area of eating disorders, which is going to be our topic uh, for this evening. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Dalton, and uh, she'll entertain us. Entertain. Entertain, that's right. All right. What I thought I would do tonight was I thought I would go through first um, the criteria of the three main eating disorders and just kind of go through the criteria first. And then I'll sort of talk about what they really look like, and um, I'll answer questions whenever you want to answer. It'll be much more interesting if you ask questions. Um, but I will, I have lots and lots of information I could talk about. People who know me can tell you that I could talk forever, talk about anything. Um, but I will try to make it relevant. And if you have questions, it really is whatever you guys want it to be. So um, the three main topics I'm going to talk about would be inter anorexia, bulimia, and then binge eating disorder, which is also known as um, compulsive overeating. So I'm going to start off with anorexia, and I'm going to read from some of the criteria to make sure that I get it specifically right. Um, sorry, that's kind of boring, but I will talk more in general later. All right, starting with the anorexia nervosa, um, you have to have a very specific criterion to meet this particular diagnosis. And the first one is a refusal to maintain body weight at or above um, the minimal normal weight for age and height, and that's 85 percent or more. And to give an example of that, is say if someone's like about five foot tall. Um, this should be about 100 pounds, and so if they're you know, 85 pounds or lower, that's significant. That meets that criteria. It could also mean with adolescents that they don't meet the expected weight gain as they're going through um, their aging. The second uh, criteria is intense fear of weight gain or becoming fat, even though they are specifically underweight. Um, third criteria would be disturbance in the way in which one's body shape is experienced undue influence of the body shape on their self-esteem or self-evaluation, and then the denial of how underweight they are. They're usually in sort of shock about how underweight. And then finally, for post uh females, which basically means once they've had the period, um, if they stop, their body stops um, letting them have their period because they aren't producing enough nutrients to maintain that. Um, and that really needs to be at least three missed cycles for that to meet that criteria. And it doesn't count. It doesn't count if their period only comes back because they're taking like birth control pills or something like that. Um, and then there's two specific types within anorexia. There's the restricting type, and then there's the binge purge type. And it's kind of just like it sounds. The restricting type are the type that um, simply just don't eat, and they do not engage in any binging, purging, or um, what we call compensatory behaviors to lose weight. And the second type is just like it sounds, but it doesn't have to be specifically. Uh, binge and purge, but they often use things like laxatives, diuretics, or enemas, which, boy, that's an interesting treatment, let me tell you, when we're doing that one. There's uh, separate issues that go with that. And basically, um, really for all three of these disorders I'm going to talk about, the age of onset is most common in, um, it used to be middle adolescence to early adulthood, and now we're seeing a trend where it's shifting to early adolescence and even pre-puberty. Um, so we'll talk about that here later. Prognosis for, particularly with anorexia, is the earlier they get into treatment, the better. Um, and the earlier stages of treatment, it's actually pretty good um, prognosis. Uh, the longer it goes on, um, especially the longer it goes on untreated, the worse the prognosis becomes. Moving on, any questions so far? Okay. Moving on to bulimia. Um, recurrent episodes of binge eating. This is one that requires binge eating. And a specific description of that is eating in a discrete period of time. It's usually within a two-hour period. Amounts of food that are definitely larger than what you would normally eat um, or in under different circumstances than what you would normally eat. And then a lack of control. <clears throat> Excuse me, a lack of control over um, what you feel like you're eating. They, they really describe a sense of completely losing control during the binge. And it has to be... Um, goes along with recurrent inappropriate compensatory behaviors. So such things as we talked about before with the binge purge, uh, vomiting, <clears throat> excessive exercise, laxatives, diuretics. Um, and that has to happen at least twice a week for three months to meet the criteria. And again, the same thing with anorexia, 
their body image um, and how they perceive themselves has an undue amount of influence in their self-esteem and their evaluation. That's an, an additional criteria. And it can't happen just in the course of an anorexic episode. Um, so that makes it distinct. And then this one has the purging type because not all bulimics make themselves sick. There are some that do not do that. And they would be listing as a non-purging type and of course those that do. The primary distinction between anorexia and bulimia that gets really confusing for a lot of people, and honestly there's a lot of overlap, is that um, the refusal to maintain the body weight and bulimics frequently look average size and sometimes even mildly to moderately even overweight. Um, so you can tell some difference with that. Um, and bulimics aren't what they would say, they're not good at going long periods of time without eating. Um, and so we'll get to that a little bit later. And again, like I said, the, uh, the time for it to start the onset, again, is starting earlier and earlier. And we're seeing in the last decade, there's some research that's supporting, supporting that it's starting by the time of late elementary school, whereas before we were looking at middle school and early high school. And then the third category I'll be talking about tonight is binge eating disorder. <clears throat> and this is recurrent episodes of binge eating, just like what we discussed before. Eating in a discrete period of time, about two hours and more than you would normally eat. Um, or eating um, secretively in the sense of lack of control during that time. And the second criteria is binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of these following criteria. Eating more rapidly than normal. Um, eating past the point of being uncomfortably full. Large amounts of food, even when you're not physically hungry. Um, eating alone because of embarrassment about how much they're eating, and then it's usually followed with a disgust of oneself, depressed, and even excessive guilt after they finished eating. Um, they have to obviously be upset about it, which I always think is a funny criteria because by definition that's what a mental health diagnosis is. It's upsetting, and it has to last at least two days a week for six months. And it does not come in addition with any compensatory behaviors like the vomiting, excessive exercising, any of those kind of behaviors, it doesn't come with that. It's just simply the binging. And I think probably the most important thing for me to say first about the binging disorder is it is probably, actually, not probably, it is definitely the most common of the eating disorders. And they think anywhere as much as 3.5% um, of women and at least 2% 2 of men will engage in this at some point in time in their life. And that's actually pretty high when you consider anorexia um, is closer to maybe 0.5 to up to 1.5% in a lifetime, and bulimia is 1 to up to 3% in a lifetime. Um, and the male to female ratio is actually kind of makes sense. It's one male for every six females with anorexia, and one male to every 10 females with um, bulimia, but they think that Actually, all the research is men, but they think that with binge eating disorder, it's probably comparable. There are probably just as many men who do it in some form, um, but that they're not coming into treatment and aren't reporting it. Um, but I imagine it's probably still closer to a one to two ratio, one male to every two, but it's much higher than what we first anticipated. And it's only, I think, in the latest updated model of our treatment manual that we really even consider it a true diagnosis. Um, it wasn't, before it was one of the things that they were looking at, but they didn't think that it was real. And I think part of the reason now that we're seeing it more and more is that the uh, bariatric surgery has been approved by more and more insurances. And so people are coming into treatment for that, and um, I don't know if you guys know much about that particular type of surgery, um, but you have to have a psychological evaluation um, to prove that your mental health is okay to have that surgery. Or otherwise you could have some potentially damaging recovery efforts. So. That's the criteria. Um, are there any questions? It's kind of confusing because a lot of it overlaps, but basically what you want to really remember um, is that anorexics is the refusal to maintain the appropriate weight, um, the excessive fear and terror about weight gain, 